Hello, friends. So I'll be talking on this uh, very unusual topic uh, as to when we would place a arterial line. So this particular talk was part of a tribate in the national conference. So where there was a, a pro and con debate, uh, the pro was arterial line is a must in all ICU patients. And the debate on the contrary was arterial line would not be needed in all ICU patients. So I was meant to give, in, give the middle sort of a ground. So honestly, there's not much of debate in this because everyone would agree that every ICU patient would not need arterial catheter. And uh, on the contrary, there are certain sick patients who would obviously need arterial line. So for me, possibly the task is little easier where I have to just give a sort of a middle path as to where uh, this role, uh, where arterial catheter has its role. So it's a little unusual topic for me. So there's not much of uh, robust evidence to this, so, but I'll try to cover this in maybe next over uh, eight to 10 minutes. So uh, when you look at the literature, uh, one third of the ICU patients, this is from US, uh, they do get arterial line uh, put in. Uh, at least one third of the ICU patients in US tend to get in arterial line. And the need for arterial line is uh, basically to have an absolute control over beat-to-beat -beat monitoring. So every beat there, there is a monitoring of the blood pressure that tends to happen. And this is more so in hemodynamically unstable because we really want to keep a close eye on the trends of the blood pressure with every beat. And we need to monitor this very closely to prevent any hypertensive episodes, mainly in hemodynamically unstable patients. And the second important reason why one would put an arterial line is in a patient who needs frequent sampling of the blood. Because in ICU, most of you would agree that there'll be a lot of frequent sampling of maybe blood gases that we may have to do or certain blood tests that we need to keep doing frequently. And uh, it, it is not easy to keep pricking the patient to get a line to get the blood out. So arterial line makes life a lot more easier. And every listener here would know that uh, having an arterial line makes life so much more easier in trying to do sampling. And the third uh, thing is where intra-arterial balloon pump is put in, where you need to know have some timing uh, timing of the IABP to ascertain whether the right timing is happening, you may need. So this is a less lesser sort of a reason why we put arterial line uh, more so in ICU. So when we look at the guidelines, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, and many of the listeners would know that surviving sepsis guidelines do suggest and recommend that any patient who is on vasopressors, it is uh, suggested and recommended that arterial line needs to be put in place for various reasons, for sampling, for monitoring of blood pressure, even to look at the lactates, so on and so forth. And this is suggested where patients are unresponsive to fluid responsive. Obviously, when they come hypotension, it doesn't mean that you need to jump in and put arterial line. You would resuscitate with fluids, but when they become unresponsive and then uh, there is a, a, a prudent need of putting in a uh, starting vasopressor. So one possibly needs to think of putting in an arterial line. And Society of Critical Care Medicine from US also puts this recommendation as a weak recommendation because how much ever you look, there's no robust evidence that you're going to get to justify the usage of arterial line. It's just the intuitive and archaic way that we put into practice that arterial line makes life so much more simpler when someone is hemodynamically unstable and where you have to do frequent sampling. So all these, all these guidelines by ESICM or suggestion by Society of Critical Care comes more as a best practice guidelines and more of an expert opinion. And uh, there are no big studies in this area to say whether having an art line in place has made any difference, but there are two sort of a studies which I will mention later. Uh, so all these recommendations have come as more of best practice guidelines, expert opinion, and there are no robust studies. So when you look at the literature, the advantages why many of us would prefer putting an arterial line is there's no major complications. So this paper looked into complication rate. It's only one to 5% of them have tend to have complications. And there are no major contraindications also to put arterial line. There are very few absolute contraindications like absent pulses and having extensive burns that may be sometimes a a reason why you may not be able to put art line or where there are very narrow uh, arteries due to severe peripheral vascular disease or Reynolds phenomena where circulation is compromised because you put in art line, 
it may compromise the arterial circulation and lead to gangrene which we sometimes see digital gangrenes happening so these are some of the relative contraindications and uh, absent pulses definitely becomes an absolute contraindications and uh, the studies have also shown in critically ill patients uh, reliance on non invasive blood pressure is something which is uh, which cannot be done because non invasive blood pressure tends to underestimate the blood pressure so it won't truly really reflect the blood pressure patient is would be having and arterial lines are shown to be beneficial in trying to determine this blood pressure in a much better way and beat to beat blood pressure monitoring tends to happen <clears throat> and in critically ill patients another important benefit of arterial line is it can measure various other derived variables like cardiac output <coughs> stroke volume and fluid responsiveness because the, when you look at the area under the curve in pulse contour analysis it uses this area under the curve to determine the cardiac output and stroke volume <clears throat> which is again very useful in intensive care settings so i'm sure many of the listeners would have used flow track or pico or the or thermodilution techniques where you need an art line to get all these indices so you get uh, stroke volume variation you get cardiac output then you get uh, stroke volume index so there are multiple uh, variables that are derived and for this you would need arterial line to get advanced hemodynamic variables like cardiac index stroke volume index stroke volume variation uh, and so on and so forth so so for for any of these advanced hemodynamic monitoring that needs to be put in and to get all these derived variables one needs to have an arterial line along with a cvc line uh when thermodilution techniques are involved where you look at the temperature change from the venous to the arterial line so we need an arterial line so so it becomes prudent that when patient is very sick and you are using advanced hemodynamic monitoring tools of this nature one would need arterial line and even simple assessment of the morphology of the arterial waveform also will give you some cues and some clues about what may be the underlying condition especially when you look at this dichrotic notch uh, which is uh, determined by x here because if you do not have this dichrotic notch or if there is a non existent or flat it possibly suggests that patient is dehydrated or there is cardiopulmonary ins uh, insufficiency or if this dichrotic notch is sort of moved down it and you have a notch present at a much lower down it increase there is a wide pulse pressure uh, which may be indicative of a distributive shock or a septic shock and you may have abnormal morphology of the arterial waveform like you have this bisphereian sort of a pulse bifid pulse uh, where uh, typically it happens in aortic regurgitation and this also tends to overestimate blood pressure so assessing or uh, looking at the morphology of the arterial waveforms also can give cues about the hydration status and about presence of valvular abnormality in some of these cases so that is also one distinct advantage of having an arterial line and many of the listeners would possibly look at the swing pattern where you have sort of a swing pattern in the arterial waveform uh, which tells you basically the patient possibly is volume responsive and that is based on a concept called stroke volume variation because in mechanically ventilated patients so during inspiration the arterial pressure increases and during expiration the arterial pressure comes down uh, and in mechanically ventilated the change of this uh, pattern of the arterial waveform in inspiration and expiration is utilized to calculate something called stroke volume variation which is uh, maximum stroke volume minus minimum stroke volume divided by mean stroke volume and if the if it is more than 12% uh, or 18% in some cases do indicate that patient is volume responsive and these are some of the indices that one uses for fluid responsiveness and there is pulse pressure variation also many of you would be using many of these monitors have these algorithms which is put into the system uh, which analyzes the waveform of the arterial uh, arterial waveform and determines this pulse pressure variation which is again maximum pulse pressure minus minimum pulse pressure divided so basically these are the heart lung interactions that tend to happen in mechanically ventilated patients where during inspiration your pulse pressure increases and during expiration pulse pressure comes down and calculation of this variation would determine whether patient would be fluid responsiveness and uh, diagnostic threshold is 12% if your pulse pressure variation is more than 12% it indicates that patient would respond to the fluid by increasing by increasing the stroke volume and the cardiac output so if you look at the this is basically heart lung interactions and uh, just to show you pictorially during inspiration 
in a mechanical ventilated patient there is increase in the pleural pressure and increase in the um, transpulmonary pressure in the lung and this increase in the pleural pressure and transpulmonary pressure leads to reduction in the right ventricular preload and it increases the right ventricular afterload in mechanically ventilated patients and this increases the right ventricular this decreases the right ventricular stroke volume on the left ventricle opposite happens there is increase in the preload in a mechanically ventilated and there is reduction in the left ventricular afterload which together leads to increase in the stroke volume and this increase in the stroke volume during inspiration is determined by maximum pulse pressure and decrease in the stroke volume on the rv is determined by the minimum pulse pressure and this difference is used is used to calculate pulse pressure variation and um, th there is a study which shows which is a meta analysis of 22 studies to look at uh, the validation of the pulse pressure variation and they have shown since it has a sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 89% which is not all that bad to utilize this as a means to determine fluid responsiveness in a patient and for this you need an arterial line so that is where we are coming up and even uh, many of you would be now doing this passive leg raising test and i'm sure many of you would agree that for passive leg raising test the way we would ascertain the fluid responsiveness is by cardiac output measure but this is one study by having a simple arterial line and looking at the pulse pressure so you look at the measure blood pressure and look at the pulse pressure and after 60 to 90 seconds after you raise the leg uh, so you measure another blood pressure and look at the pulse pressure if there is change in pulse pressure which is delta pulse pressure more than 15% it indicates fluid responsiveness and this was shown in this particular study that came in 2016 by thai group uh, so basically goes on to show having an arterial line it makes it uh, much more easier to do this test to determine whether patient is going to respond to the fluid by looking at the delta pulse pressure but there is no robust literature on this in tropical disease like dengue and malaria so now coming to hard data if all the listeners want to know whether arterial line makes a difference to the outcome then possibly there's not much data so this was one retrospective cohort study which came in 2015 to see whether uh, placement of arterial lines has had any bearing so obviously it did not have as an independent factor did not make a difference with regards to outcome or mortality and in fact patients with arterial line it was shown in this study there was increase in the length of stay and there was this another huge study uh, which was a propensity matched cohort analysis which came in 2000 2014 where uh, they call it as project impact study in mechanically ventilated patients to see whether placement of arterial line made a difference and even this study did not show any benefit with regards to any of the variables so there are certain downsides in having arterial line because interpretation of arterial line trace becomes very important because if you are acting upon a resonant trace of this nature because this would be overestimating blood pressure so and uh, certain erroneous interventions may be put in place and or you may see a wave like this which is a dampened waveform which underestimates blood pressure and there may be certain interventions that will be done based on this waveform if you are not able to recognize that this is a dampened or resonant waveform so having a good knowledge about the waveforms interpretation of the waveforms and the derived indices from the waveforms like pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation all this go hand in hand in a long way in influencing outcomes in critically unwell patients and there there is another caveat with arterial line because the arterial line readings are different in different areas because in radial artery it may show one reading and if you go to femoral artery it may show a different reading so this is a just a uh, illustrative comparison as to how the arterial uh, trace and the uh, and the readings look in brachial artery radial artery and femoral artery there was this study which came from australia in fact i worked with steve galuccio in australia so he has done this study as a part of his project where they saw that patients with femoral artery the blood pressure recording was found to be 63% higher in femoral artery as compared to the radial artery which means to say there is differences in where the arterial line is put when you are interpreting the blood pressure so these are some of the caveats so garland et al did suggest that uh, to conclusively subscribe to placing arterial line rigorous control trials are definitely needed to uh, really see if uh, one needs to substantiate by evidence if arterial lines can make a difference in the outcome of the patients so routine use of arterial line in icu is limited expert opinion and not evidence based medicine 
So my take on this arterial line is it is justifiable in critically unsafe and hemodynamically unstable patients who have not responded to fluid resuscitations and who are needing vasopressors. The reason is once they go on vasopressors, you need a bit to bit blood pressure to try to titrate the vasopressors down or up, up regulate or down regulate the vasopressors to optimize the blood pressure. And, and most importantly, when you're using cardiac output monitors of uh, any nature, so definitely one needs to have arterial line to look at stroke volume variation, to look at cardiac index, cardiac output. If you're using any of these fancy cardiac output monitors, obviously one needs to have arterial line in place. And most importantly, in ICU, many of you would agree, it is very hard to get peripheral veins to do sampling. And so when the sampling becomes an issue, especially we, we, every day there'll be some sort of a sampling happening in ICU, and it's not easy to get uh, peripheral vein access. So for that, it makes life a lot more easier for nursing and, and, uh, and generally in ICU where uh, nurses are overburdened with work and staffing issues, it's easier, much easier to have arterial line to do the sampling uh, regularly. So these are some of the justifiable reasons so the debate that arterial lines are needed for all patients definitely cannot be justified. But arterial lines in a sick ICU patients is justified, especially when there are vasopressors or when you're using advanced hemodynamic monitoring or whether you want to do passive leg rising test, you want to look at the change in the pulse, uh, delta pulse pressure. So there you would possibly depend on having an arterial line or in patients who are waterlogged and you have sampling issues, having an arterial line makes life easier. So that would be the way we could uh, approach. So thank you very much. I end this talk with this beautiful quote. To change ourselves effectively, we have to first change our perceptions. So thank you one and one.